Well, I am very excited to be here with a fellow podcaster today. I am here with Amber Cullum. Thank you for joining me today, Amber. Thanks so much for having me, Courtney. It's a delight to be here. Yeah. Amber is the host of the Grace Enough podcast, and she's a great follow on Instagram. <laughs> she oh, talks- thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you, make us, you take us along on your walks and I- <laughs> talk with us about what God's doing in your life and what's been on the podcast and these discussions that you have. And, and I mean, on your podcast, you're having some really important conversations and, and talking to some people that are, are, are writing really important stuff right now. So, mm. uh, what is your Instagram handle? It's grace enough podcast and then an underscore Amber. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely suggest you go follow her on Instagram, but Amber, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So like you said, I'm Amber. Uh, I am mom to three, uh, all of which I partially homeschool. So that means they go to school two days a week and then they're home with me three days a week. Uh, I also have a husband, Sam. We have eight chickens in our backyard. <laughs> People are always like, why do you tell that? I'm like, cause it just, you know, tells a little about the chaos <laughs> uh, and a dog. No, yeah. uh, And so that's what I do most of the time is school my kids. I'm mostly at home, uh, but I do podcast and consider it really a gift as a stay at home mom to be able to Mm -hmm. podcast. That's kind of why I started it. I just wanted something else to connect me to the outside world. (laughs) And uh, that's kind of why, because before I became a mom, I was a physical therapist. So I like to connect with people. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've been walking with Christ since early college. Uh, I knew him before that, but I wouldn't say I was growing in him before that. Mm. Um, but yeah, so that's just, you know, a tip of the iceberg, a little about me. That's right. Uh, yes, I'm jealous of your chickens. One day I will have chickens of my own, (laughs) but they're messy. (laughs) Yeah, I've heard. And I've, I've watched you like corral them to like trying to get them (laughs) into their pen. (laughs) And I won't pretend like that is something I do very often. Honestly, my oldest son takes probably the most care of them. And then my husband, because I told them like, do you get chickens? I'm not responsible for keeping one more thing alive. (laughs) That's, that's your responsibility. (laughs) I'm not doing it. (laughs) You know, we have talked about that with like a dog. Yeah. You know, we'll see like a cute puppy and I'm like, no, I don't need one more live thing. I know. Like in our home, we won't get chickens until we have more space, yeah, which means exactly another home, but we don't, I'm like, we don't yeah. have enough space for yeah. more chickens and d- another dog or another child, much less. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I totally get it. Tell us about the grace enough podcast. What do you guys talk about and what's the purpose of it? Yeah. Well, grace enough started out primarily as a, a conversation with people really sharing their stories about how God can use any story, no matter what it is to impact his kingdom. And yes, Mm -hmm. that does require surrender. It requires trust, but ultimately we would kind of come back around to talking about the grace of God being enough to cover things. Now we still talk about that, uh, but I've definitely focused a lot more on digging into some of the hard truths of being And sometimes I even hate to use the word truth. Um, Just some of the hard parts about walking with Christ. Um, How do we wrap our mind around some of the things that don't make sense to us or Mm -hmm. uh, fellow Christians that believe differently than us? And so it's much more now about kind of delving into those hard parts of our faith, yet also the unwavering grace of God to really journey alongside us in that if we're just patient to keep walking with them. Mm. Um, So yeah, that's what it's about. And I love, what's one thing I love about podcasting is I think we can talk about some of these topics in like a long form, you Mm -hmm. know, way that uh, where the, the conversation can kind of develop and we can um, have that conversation for other people to hear and listen to it and agree with, and sometimes like really disagree with. Yes. Um, but then you can, they can have another friend listen to the conversation and then they themselves can have a conversation. I feel like what podcasts do is they start, 
they are a good conversation starter um, mm-hmm. for people. And and I love that you're talking about some of these topics that are are harder to discuss. Um, yeah. Maybe aren't they don't wrap up really nicely as like a Sunday sermon topic, you know? And so maybe we're not talking about them on a weekly basis within the church, but, uh, you know, you're like, this is still a part of, of humans. This is still a part of our culture. This is still a part of something we experience as Christians, even though we don't talk about it. And so I love that you're having those conversations. Do you find that it's hard to have some of those like more difficult conversations or even to talk to people that don't believe the same thing you do? Yeah. I mean, I will say I haven't had as many people on that. I totally disagree with, which is something I've been a bit convicted about Mm. um, because it is easier to bring people on who agree with you. But with that said, some of the things that I have grown into probably in the last 10 years are some things that maybe all Christians wouldn't say they agree with. And I don't mean Mm. um, these outlandish like topics. That's not what I'm talking about, but just creating space to say, hey, what about that person's perspective? Like, have we considered um, that maybe their lived reality actually does impact the way that they view Christ and there's still space for them? Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I find it hard to get the pushback when someone listens to the episode and they come at me with, you know, what about this? And what about that? Because none of us want to be, well, I shouldn't say none of us. My personality certainly does not want to be ruffled, um, or pushed back against. I'm, you know, so I get a little bit nervous about that, but I've also learned a lot through podcasting, uh, to say, okay, tell me more, tell Mm. me more about why you think that, you know, um, because the reality is there's a lot of people who believe the gospel who may not believe every little nuance, just like we do. Yeah, that's so true. I'm, I'm the same way. I controversy is like something I try to avoid at all costs. And there have been a couple episodes that we've done and I'm almost anxious as I'm like pushing the publish button, (laughs) you know, and my husband's like, why, why would that be an issue? So what if people have a problem? And I'm like, that tells you about like his personality and how he, he welcomes controversy because of the, the conversations you can have. Yes. And I'm like, okay, I need it. I need to take like a little bit (laughs) like that from him. It's not everybody's gifting though. I Um, know. I know. (laughs) Oh, it's hard. It's hard. Well, we're going to talk about scripture today. We're going to talk about, um, uh, a little, like one specific part. We're actually going to talk about Sabbath and we're going to talk about, uh, that's a topic that I think we've like mentioned here and there. And I'm so excited to kind of dive in today. But before we get to Sabbath, can you talk about how your love of scripture developed and the journey that you went through to get to the point where you are now in your relationship with with scripture? Yeah. So when I was in college, like I said, I grew up uh, in a culturally Christian area or home, I guess Mm -hmm. you could say. And so it wasn't, though, until college that, um, I mean, God just really got a hold of my heart and... I was a sophomore, I I think it was second semester when I finally just said, you know what, I'm going to go to a Bible study and some people that were acquaintances, uh, you know, and and I praise God for people in college. And even now as an adult that are willing to lead a Bible study. And it's not because they have all the answers. It's because Mm. they also want to learn. And so they're not coming in to say like, oh, I'm leading this because I'm a great leader and I know all things they're coming into it because they just want to do a Bible study. And so that's what happened to me. Um, and I loved, loved, loved digging in and learning more. And so, um, I am someone who loves to learn. So it was a study like that, that I did the very first one. It was great for me that it was like, take us, you know, a passage, break it down, um, Mm, answer questions, you know, so it was that kind of study. Um, and so I loved it so much that, pretty much every semester after that, I continued to either be a part of some type of Bible study or lead, um, one of those types of Bible studies. But then 
after I got out of grad school, I was invited to Bible study fellowship. And I don't know if you know anything about Bible study fellowship. It's an international interdenominational study, um, where there's just a four prong approach. You read the word, you answer questions, you, um, do in a small group setting where you discuss the questions and then you listen to a lecture. Um, Mm -hmm. and then you have notes to read. And honestly, it just continued to foster a love for the word of God in my heart. Things came alive for the first time. Mm. Um, and I've had the opportunity through that for the last 20 years to read the word, almost the entire word, not just front to back, but really dissecting how all pieces together. Yeah. Um, and so I think people can do that and never really fall in love with Jesus. Um, true, but I did. And, um, it wasn't work for me because it wasn't school. It was something I enjoyed doing. And so that's yeah. kind of, now I do community Bible study, which is very similar to BSF. Um, and honestly, I can't recommend it enough to any follower of Christ to get involved in a study like that. Mm. Well, and I think that study, one of the things that, you know, you have in that is community. And Mm -hmm. I think that's really beneficial when we are studying scripture, we can study it on our own, but there is certainly some part of um, being in community and and seeing how Mm -hmm. others are reading it and interpreting it and, and seeing how God is kind of speaking to us with it and either them being the same or them being yeah. different and us actually getting to learn from the differences that God is, you know, is speaking. I loved it earlier, you know, you said that, that scripture to you was something that like you knew, uh, like growing up. And then you kind of started to dig in a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. And when you and I were talking uh, previous uh, to this, you said something to me. And I actually wrote it down because I was like, oh, that's really good. And I'd Mm -hmm. love for you to explain it. Um, You said the truths in scripture are like jewels that can be cut in different ways. And Mm -hmm. I even heard you before, you know, in the interview when you were kind of talking about some of the truths that you knew before And Mm -hmm. now you're kind of like taking, seeing a different light on them. What does that mean that scripture is like a jewel that can be cut in different ways? Yeah, I wish I could say um, who, oh, I cannot remember who it was, a a sermon that I listened to uh, actually just recently, but also like two years ago. It's one of my husband and I's favorite sermons. It's through Bridgetown, but it wasn't John Mark Comer, who was their pastor at the time. It was someone else. But he talks so much about how scripture is so amazing because it's actually a book that could just be read over and over and over again from front to back or in little chunks. Um, You could just read the wisdom parts of it. You could just read the gospels. And no matter how many times you go through it, you glean something either new or different, or you add to what you already know. Mm. And that's what I think about that's why I say that about a jewel. Um, you know, when you, we diamonds don't come out looking like the rings on our fingers, right? When you, when you find a diamond in a mind, it's actually very dull and, um, doesn't look that significant. We just know it's significant in our mind. If you're a miner, uh, because you know what you're looking for. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the way scripture is, you know, you read it that first time. And for example, Jesus is the savior of the world. He died on a cross for our sins. Well, that's incredible when you hear it the first time and you believe it, but to us, sometimes it loses its luster when you've been walking for 20 years and it shouldn't, but it does. That's just the normal, um, way we respond to things in our lives. But when you read it again and you begin to see other truths of that, where actually that's what they were talking about back in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And that's actually uh, foreknowledge. Uh, When we see David and some of the things he did, that's foreknowledge of this Messiah to come. And so that's what I mean by it can be a jewel that can be cut in different ways, because as you keep reading it, you realize it's not just that Jesus died on a cross for your sins. Like the gospel is so much more than that. Mm. Like he wants to live with you now. He wants to walk with you now. He wants to embody you here on earth. And there's great freedom in that too. 
So hopefully that answers your question, but it's just, it, it's a never ending uh, mine when you really dig into scripture from front to back. And I'm, I'm hearing you use that like mining, uh, you know, analogy. And I'm thinking as a miner, you go in and you get this, what you know is something precious, but it's mm -hmm. dull and it's dirty. Yes. And then, uh, you know, the jeweler takes this rock that looks like nothing and starts cutting mm -hmm. and starts shaping it. And uh, what you know is that uh, inside it is something extraordinary, mm -hmm. but it's the shaping process that makes it shine that makes it yeah. brilliant you know that makes it precious and uh well no let me take it back it's precious it from a lot the of time beginning. <laughs> yeah 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 it's precious from the beginning right they knew it was precious that's why they pull it out of the mind so it's precious but then you begin to see the beauty as mm -hmm. they begin to cut away and I'm like Oh, that sounds like a sermon, but you know, like, yeah. I, th and that's what, but almost scripture, uh, that's what you're seeing is as you're starting to like see these different stories and the way that mm -hmm. they work together and the way you begin to get that better, fuller picture of what's in the middle of the rock, yeah. not just mm -hmm. what you can see from the outside or an right. initial viewing. So I love that idea and it becomes more alive. I agree with you. I love studying yeah. scripture. I, I call myself, I'm just a nerd. And like, yeah, but me for me, I think that it, I'm always seeing new things and mm -hmm. it's always teaching me more about myself. And then it's teaching me more about the God that I serve. And right. so therefore I, I'm like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta keep reading, you know, I yeah. have to keep studying and, uh, it becomes more and more. One of the things that we see in scripture that, uh, is you know, different in certain areas and we can, uh, uh, you know, interpret it differently is the idea of Sabbath. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, the biblical picture of Sabbath can really contradict <laughs> with what American culture sees as like life just in general. Uh, you know, it, it kind of contradicts with how we're going to achieve the American dream or mm -hmm. um, what's considered to be success. Uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people, it's really hard for them to rectify the biblical idea of Sabbath and finding success in life. So in, yeah. in your opinion, what is, what does scripture say about Sabbath and, and how is it even possible to apply that in today's culture? Whew, that's a loaded question. It is. Um, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. I just, I don't know that I'll be able to do it justice. I mean, well, the Bible has a lot to say about Sabbath, as we know, particularly in the Old Testament, but somehow along the way, we're like, oh, if it's in the Old Testament, we shouldn't pay attention to it. Mm. And um, I don't say that from a place of judgment because I have been there. Uh, that's the reason why our family started trying to institute Sabbath rhythm into our family, because my husband was just exhausted with work, never able to turn mm. it off. Uh, because that's just the way of our world. Now, if you work, uh, expect, particularly in the job my husband's in, like, you know, there's always people emailing him. There's always people texting him. There's always a voicemail. There's always a to-do list. Yeah. There's always somebody on teams asking a question. And so it has to be a conscious choice. But mm -hmm. if we go back, I mean, Sabbath was God's idea in the very beginning. It is not just something that came about as a result of the law, because God said, I created everything in six days and then I rested. Mm -hmm. Did he rest because he was tired? No, he rested actually as a celebration. And as an example, a mm. celebration of his creative power, a celebration of it is finished, all this chaos. That's what it says in the beginning. God took the chaos and he began creating order. Yeah. Um, and out of that came everything that we know to be creation. Um, and so when you begin to think like, okay, God actually spoke this in the very beginning, uh, it can kind of shift your mindset a little bit of like, oh, this wasn't just something that he forced the Israelites to do because he was mean or because he just wanted to add to their to-do list. He actually wanted them to remember. Um, mm. And he tells us that not just about Sabbath, 
but all through scripture, remember, remember, remember about all kinds of things. And why do we need to remember? Um, because we forget. <laughs> Yeah. I, if you're a parent and you have children, particularly middle schoolers, you know that the forgetfulness, like literally they knew how to uh, put their deodorant on for about a year. And then all of a sudden something happened and now they no longer remember that they need yeah. to put on deodorant. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. They remember well, one day the list of things they need to do <laughs> when they wake up in the morning and when they get home. And then all of a sudden the next day they've forgotten three or four things. It's, it's quite incredible. And I yeah. say that laughing because, uh, well, number one, I laugh because I'm living it right now. And if I don't <laughs> laugh, I'll go crazy. That's right. That's right. And number two, it's true of every single one of us. Yeah. Uh, that was who we were too. And mm -hmm. it's who we still are because God keeps saying to us in his word, remember. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those things he asks us to remember is the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. Uh, it's the only law he actually applies to himself. Oh, and yeah. And so when you, and it's not, he doesn't apply this law to himself as a burden. Again, for him, it was a celebration of his creative power of it being finished of as an example to you work and then you rest because your body you, my creation is going to fall apart if you don't rest. Mm, I love that idea of celebration just because it's like, mm -hmm. how often do we celebrate what we've done in a day or mm -hmm. in a week? Because there's always more to be done. So when do you celebrate the completion of something? Well, not often. And if you actually began, and this is one of the things, if we go back to the jewel, that as I've read the word, like we've left so much behind um, in Jewish culture and heritage, if you're yeah. not Jewish, um, that's rich when it comes to celebration, because their entire mm. calendar is actually created around celebration. That's it's right. called feasts. Yeah, that's uh, right. It wasn't all burdensome. There yeah. are lots of celebration because God wants you to remember you were a slave in Egypt and I brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And in the same way, we're slaves to sin. And he has mm -hmm. brought us out of sin with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. That's right. And so that's one of the biggest reasons why we celebrate Sabbath, because people will say, isn't it, um, isn't that legalistic? Well, it depends on what you decide to do with it. Right. Yeah. Jesus comes on the scene in Mark. I think it's in Matthew as well. And the Pharisees are saying all these things to him. Why are you doing this on the Sabbath? And why are you doing that on the Sabbath? And, you know, eventually he just stops and he tells them Sabbath was actually created for you. Mm. Wow. It was not created so that you would um, have one more thing to do to worship me. It was actually created for you. Mm. And what do they do? They just get mad again and walk away and start plotting how to kill the, kill him because they didn't like that he was not observing all of the rules. In that case, it was picking grain on the Sabbath. And he goes on to tell them the story about David. You know, what about David when he entered the temple and he took the bread of the presence um, and fed his people? Well, they were hungry. You eat when you're hungry. Mm -hmm. And so that took a lot of this legalistic religiosity off of it because people uh, when, had taken Sabbath and said like God told us to rest so therefore right. you can only walk this many steps and you that's can right. only like you can't even pick a grain of that's right. you know barley or anything and if you do you're breaking the Sabbath they had made it no so healing, hard no nothing mm -hmm. yeah no nothing uh like you're going to do all this work on Saturday to make sure that you do next to nothing on Sabbath. And here Jesus is, you know, the son of God doing stuff. And they're like, you're doing it wrong. And he's like, yeah, I created that guys. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. And I mean, and I think with Jesus too, he just like he did with everything, he wasn't coming in as he said to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. That's right. And, and we have always, um, I have always been taught like, well, that just means basically we're kind of ushering in this new, you know, 
post-resurrection religion or not religion, Christianity. Yeah. And so all of that stuff falls to the wayside, but wow, we've really given up a lot in our culture to say like, we don't need that anymore. Mm. Mm. God knows we need rest. So he gave us this as a gift, um, number one to rest, but also to just realize that, you know what, if you don't wash your laundry today or mow your grass or answer those six emails, you're still going to wake up tomorrow and I'm still going to be the God of the universe. You can trust me to provide for you. Hmm. Um, And there's something really restorative that starts taking place in our soul. Once we put this Sabbath rest into practice, uh, you won't wake up and say, oh my gosh, it's so easy. It's almost like this depressed feeling comes over you a little bit because you're so used to doing something all the time Mm. that you actually have to plan to rest. Um, And so I don't, I can kind of go into how you could do it, uh, in our culture now, if you would like for me to, I know you asked that and I'll just keep talking and talking, (laughs) Um, No, but that's great because I think the the idea of Sabbath, I I hear that it's important. I hear that it's, you know, uh, is that those that have really tried it and those that have, um, put it in as a practice in their life, no one has ever said, I tried it and it just, it wasn't for me. It was I've awful. Never, it was awful. <laughs> I've never heard that. I have heard uh, like, well, we did it one Sunday and, uh, you know, all these other things happened. And so we didn't, it didn't actually happen. So before we get to how you did it, mm-hmm. here's my question for you that maybe someone is, is listening going, okay, so Sabbath means rest and mm-hmm. we see it in scripture is Sabbath. Like, does it only happen on Sunday? Because I grew up in a culture that says like Sabbath is Sunday right? Mm -hmm. Uh, then there's another culture that says Sabbath is Saturday. When does Sabbath happen? Yeah. Well, Sabbath, actually the word is Shabbat and it actually means cease. So, um, it doesn't even mean rest. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does, and it doesn't, it really means cease to stop, which we interpret as rest. Um, And in Jewish culture, when it actually began being instituted, or at least what we have documented is it was from Friday at sundown Mm -hmm. until Saturday at sundown. Mm. Now, once again, there's a whole historical thing about how we ended up switching to Sunday. And that has to do with Constantine and the Nicene Creed and things that people here probably do not want to hear me talk about, but it actually was a bit political, which... Mm. It's so unfortunate, right? Because it's not about the day. Um, It's about the observance. And that's where we have to let some of the legalism go. That's Mm. the things we tend to cling on to, or we resist, right? We say, I'm not doing Sabbath because it's a list of rules. Or if you don't do it on Saturday, you're not doing it right. Yeah. And Jesus said, it's created for you. It's Mm. a gift for you. Um, Mm. We observe from uh, five or six on Friday, only until noon on Saturday, we have Mm. yet to make it to 24 hours. I honestly thought we would by now, uh, then the pandemic hit and we were kind of resting most of the weekend, (laughs) um, cause no activities were going on Mm -hmm. and we just haven't revisited since then, um, to extend it. So that's a little bit of kind of what we observe. Sunday is not restful for me. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's a little more restful now because I don't volunteer on Sunday at church. But what about all the people who work in the church? That's not their Sabbath. They're like full on pedal to the metal. It's a Monday for them, right? Like they're working like crazy. Yeah. So we can't make it about the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's important. And I've heard that from, you know, a lot of faith leaders or those that work in the church is I take another day as my yep. Sabbath. And I, I think that's important for us to re- remember if, if Sunday is a day full of going to church and mm-hmm. going to lunch with p- friends and, you know, all of these activities, are we really resting? Um, mm-hmm. 
And that's an important question. Now, how, tell us, give us some, some tips, some tricks, like tell us your journey. How did you guys do this in your family? Um, and what did you find that worked? And what did you try that you were like, well, that wasn't successful? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like the most help, and I will say my husband and I did an episode on this and I'll send it to you so you can put yes, it in the show please. notes, but mm-hmm. it's you know, cra- crafting a Sabbath rhythm for your family. Mm. And we just kind of talked about what we did and we got a lot of what we learned from family teams, Jeremy Pryor and Jefferson Bethke. And um, we kick off Sabbath with a Shabbat meal which doesn't have to be anything spectacular. Um, It's just the Jewish people, when their work week is done, that's how they signify that it's time to go into their rest. Now, again, Mm. you have to think celebration here, not rules. So everything I've done up to this point, I'm preparing to rest. Mm. I know I can't stand for the house to be filthy. So at this point in my life, like my kids and I are helping tidy up on Friday. Like Mm -hmm. we're making sure that happens. So what is it in your life that makes you crazy? Like you can't rest if that's, you know, undone. Yeah. And for me, it's these certain things and it's going to, it might be different for you. Like after our Shabbat meal, we tried for about a month to not clean the dishes up. And like Saturday I could not rest. So now Mm -hmm. we have 10 minutes after dinner where we clean the dishes up because again, this is made for us not a rule, all of these other things. Yeah. And so we kick off with a meal. Um, it's part of Jewish tradition to speak a blessing. Um, so the oldest woman at our table, usually it'll be me speaks a blessing over the daughters, uh, Mm. the males. It's usually my husband, but sometimes my in-laws are with us. And so they speak it over us. They speak a meal, I mean, a a blessing over the kids. And it's mainly just a blessed thing that says, um, you know, we hope that you have the faith of Mary and the righteousness of Christ as you build our family from generation to generation. And then for the men, it goes down a lineage that looks a little bit different. Uh, We light candles and we speak the verse that I just told you, which was, um, you know, God brought us out of Egypt with an out- mighty hand and an outstretched arm, but we always continue that on to what has Christ done for us. Mm. We're not Jewish. We're Christian. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Jesus was Jewish. And so he did practice these things. And so there's a lot of rich heritage there that we actually want to be like him. We can actually do some things that he did. Those so blessings meal- that you speak, Are they Mm -hmm. things that are already written down or are you creating them? Yeah. So we have taken, um, and this is, again, we got this from family teams. It is the Jewish blessing that they use to bless their kids. We add the Christ piece on the end. Mm Okay. Okay. And then it's not, you're not having to like create something each week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. No, not at all. Yeah. Um, And then we also do the Arianic blessings. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift in and on and on. Yeah. Uh, And then we sit down and we eat. And after we eat, we play games together. So we really try to minimize digital distraction. Mm. um, Because as we know, in our culture, that's usually what makes our brains just go crazy. It's a huge temptation for me, huge temptation for my husband. So it's not something we do perfectly, um, but that's what we try to do. Hmm. And then the biggest thing when we wake up on Saturday morning is we have three kids. They're 12, 10, no, 12, nine, and six. Um, So they each do still get their 30 minute TV time in the morning. Okay. Uh, Is that the best option? I would say no. I would say training your family to read, do quiet play, be outside, um, would be the best because again, TV is usually not restorative. Uh, it's numbing, but it's usually not restorative. Mm. However, we are also trying to get rest as parents and we're not at the place where we have trained our kids to leave us alone. Um, Mm. if I'm just being honest with you. So I like to go for a run. Um, I very much recharge when I'm running. It's where I connect with the Lord really well. I'll do that on a Saturday morning. 
my husband uh, likes to do something with his hands. So um, he may go out and play disc golf. He may be woodworking. So there are things like that. And there's a great quote. I actually have it written down here by um, Abraham Heschel. And he says, six days a week, we wrestle with the world, wringing profit from the earth. On the Sabbath, we especially care for the seed of eternity planted in the soul. The world has our hands, but our soul belongs to someone else. Hmm. And it's really powerful because he also says, if you work with your mind, so let's say you're an engineer like my husband, Sabbath with your hands. Hmm. If you work with your hands, so let's say you do manual labor, Sabbath with your mind. So maybe it's sitting down and reading. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So that's a little bit of what we do, taking in nature, um, focusing on all that God has provided uh, is a great way to really just get started. What I don't hear you saying is like, okay, so we stick together as a family and we sit Mm -hmm. in a room and like quietly and like, uh, cause I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old and saying like, I'm going to need you to like sit quietly for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound like fun for anybody. That's right. (laughs) Not for them and not for me. So do you, you guys kind of have like your own rhythms and then maybe sometimes you're doing stuff as a family? Okay. Yep. So our biggest rhythm together is at Shabbat when we start. And, um, it's great because we do like, we do, we have plates that we only eat off of on Friday night, not because they're expensive, fancy plates. They're just, Um, it's just something that is in the brain signaling it's time to rest. Mm. It's time for us to say our work is finished. Yeah. God has provided for us another week. Mm. Now we're going to go into family time. And so uh, that time is always together. It's fantastic too. Cause once you do it for a while, some of your kids will be like, this is kind of cheesy at first. And then if you don't do it, <laughs> yep. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Or they're telling their friends, sorry, we can't come over. It's Shabbat tonight. And people are like, what's Shabbat? <laughs> and it's incredible though. Because- or like, you're not Jewish. No, no, I'm not. But, <laughs> no. but I mean, goodness, my savior was so yeah. amen to that. Um, and so I think it's like anything else. When yeah. you introduce something to your kids, if you break their routine, it actually messes them up. Hmm. So why don't we actually bias our kids towards practices that we want them to continue or that they start believing I can rest. Hmm. God will provide. Yeah. God is faithful. I don't have to spend my wills 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Nor we, we does see God how, want me to. <laughs> right. Because we see how well that's doing for us as adults. That's right. I yeah. mean, and this idea that you, we find ourselves like that it's lazy um, if we just hang around and don't do anything. I mean, God really did make us to work super hard for six days. Mm-hmm. And then he did say very, very clearly, stop. Mm. Yeah. And he does that for our brains our bodies. And again, to remember that he will provide. Yeah. He will provide. And so if I were to give like just little tips, choose a day that works for your family or a time period, my in-laws, they were trying to figure out how to do it. My brother-in-law has to start work super early in the morning on Saturdays. And I said, okay, well, what about from like 2 PM until you go to Sunday school on Sunday morning? And that's what works for them. Cause they have a lot of stuff going on at church on Sunday. So that works for them. Um, Form a habit of removing digital distraction, like just get in the habit now. It's good for your brain, put it away and then make the Shabbat meal special. Uh, Again, Mm. not necessarily special food, but just, you know, the different plates. My kids get a special drink that they don't get all other weeks or all every other day of the week. So it just signals our brain. It's time to rest. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, and I, I love the idea of like setting that up for our kids. Um, and, and teaching them what I, what I loved that you said was that we're supposed to work hard for six days and then rest. But because we don't have a Sabbath instead, we're like, trying anything we can to find these like one hour or 30 minute moments where we rest 
And the only thing that we can do in that time is numb out like, okay, so I'm going to, you know, sit here for an hour at night and I'm going to, you know, scroll Instagram or watch a movie or, or whatever. And that becomes our rest because it's like, well, I don't know when the next time is that I'm going to get rest where you can almost work harder for six days. If you know yeah. that you've got this Sabbath coming up and Absolutely. you're like, I am looking forward to that and I will get rest then so I can work harder now. But mm-hmm. you talked about it's mind numbing, but it's not restorative. What's the difference right. in something that's mind numbing and something that's restorative? So I think every single one of us can right now say, how, what is something that actually fills your soul? So when you get done doing it, you walk away and you actually feel energized. Mm. Like you actually feel like your heart and your soul have come alive. Like a lot of people, and I'll say sacred rest is a great book by Dr. Sandra Dalton. I would recommend it because she says different ways that different people rest. Mm. One of them is creative rest. Maybe you're an artist and you've put that aside because you're too busy. Yeah. But when you sit down, and you draw or you paint, your soul comes alive. Mm -hmm. For me, going to dinner and having like coffee with a few close, close friends where we just like have difficult conversations, but good, (laughs) deep, difficult conversations, like that wears my husband out. I walk away from that and I am like, I don't even know how to explain it, but I think Mm -hmm. most people listening understand that there's something like that for you. Yeah. It's a hike. It's, it's a swim. It's seeing the mountains. It, it, what is it that when you finish it, you feel energized? That's what's restorative for you. Mm-hmm. A lot of us have forgotten what that is, but someone once said to me, if you kind of go back to your 10 year old self and you think about some of the things you love to do, then you might be surprised that if you did them now, they're very restorative to your soul. Yeah. Riding a bike. Maybe it's, I mean, I know this sounds cheesy, climbing a tree. There are Mm. things like that that are going to engage your senses in a way that's restorative. Yeah. Mind numbing. How, how do you feel after you've spent 30 minutes scrolling Instagram? Do you walk away energized or do you walk away tired, groggy, or just kind of apathetic. Hmm. Um, same thing with like, let's say you go to a celebration and you loved it. You had fun, but you didn't just have the one drink. You had the three drinks and then you feel gross. Well, that's, that's mind numbing. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) yeah, you overate. That's mind numbing. That's not restorative, but sitting down with a good meal with friends and just having great conversation and food That for some people is incredibly restorative Mm -hmm. and it's something God's instructed us to do. So that's the things you have to think about. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's going to be different for everybody. Yeah, that, that makes a lot. I think uh, it's some people are like, don't compare to this. But like, you know, when you think about going on a diet, you're taking out some of those things. uh, You're paying attention to what you put into your body sometimes and, um, and why you put it into your body. And yeah. then you're paying attention to what things sometimes when we go on a diet, we didn't realize we felt bad until we remove yeah. some things from <laughs> our diet. And you're like, oh, I actually feel good for the first time in a long time. And it's because mm-hmm. I'm not filling my body with stuff that it, it doesn't like. And what right. I what I hear you saying is uh, re-explore, explore some of these things yeah. that make your your soul and your spirit come alive come alive and feel healthy again and feel active instead of weighed down by so much. We, we don't watch the news anymore in our house. Yeah. Cause that There's was no shame. Yeah. That, that was one thing that it was like, I feel no, in, I mean, we, we, we have other ways that we keep up with what's going on in the world, but watching the morning news anymore. I'm like, this is so depressing. Yeah. And is this really how we want to start our day is with this in our home. And then well, my kids were listening to it. And I'm like, no, that's what I love. Something about John Eldridge. He talks about benevolent detachment and he just mm. talks about like God never created you to carry all the problems of the world. Yeah. He didn't. 
And so we've, we've created this thing where we make people feel guilty that they don't know everything going on around the world. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is very much a new thing Yeah, where, it we, is. Turn, where we turn on the TV and like every single thing going on all over the world, like all of a sudden it's what it's burdensome mm-hmm. uh, and it doesn't make you a bad person, mm-hmm. less of a Christian for not wanting to fill your mind with that every single day. Mm. If you really want to pray for people, you know, some people say, well, how are you supposed to help and pray? Well, God never created you to help every human on earth. That's his job. Mm. He has other humans around the world to actually help do that too. That's right. Um, <laughs> that he, sent, and, he sent them out, right? To all yeah, of, yeah. And I mean, You can pray for the nations of the world without knowing every single one of their burdens. That's right. God just did not. He is the one who can handle it. That's not, not man, not man. Mm -hmm. So I could get on that soapbox too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you've talked about like the things that you created and how your kids have kind of assimilated to this. Mm -hmm. What are some of the benefits that you guys have seen by actually enacting this Sabbath time in your family's life? Well, one of them is really what you said earlier. Um, and, and Doug Gamble, who was a pastor of mine, I remember him saying this early on on my show when we had not, we had just started sticking our toes into the water of Sabbath. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, you'll get to the point where you can push through hard things in the week because you know, Sabbath is coming. Yeah. Um, and you kind of pointed towards that earlier. And so that's been one of the benefits to, um, know that the break is coming, know that the family around the intentional time around the dinner table is coming. And now we eat dinner as a family around our table every night, but it's different on Shabbat. It's just different. Mm. Um, so that's been one of the benefits. Another one is it has helped my husband and I to communicate more about what our needs are to feel restored. So it's really easy to just, you know, on the weekend, feel like you got to get everything done, but wait a minute, I want to rest. No, I want to rest, but you get to do this. And so it's helped us to say, like, what do you need to do to find rest during this morning? Um, Mm. What do I need to do? And so we've become a little bit better of a team um, because we both want to be rested. That's the other benefit. Um, And then the third one that I'll say which was the biggest reason we started this is we wanted, so I'm going to try to hurry. Sorry. No, Jefferson Bethke had said, that's what got us wanting to do it because he had talked about some research that one of the biggest reasons they found that less kids as adults leave the Mormon and Jewish faith is because the practices they have around the table that are set every week. That is one of the big differences between those religions and Christianity. Hmm. Now that sermon went into, or that talk went into a lot more things, but that's what finally said, okay, we want to give our family this identity yeah. that says we are anchored in the Sabbath because we believe that God is faithful and that he's going to provide. And so it has given us that, like it is an anchor for our family. It is not a false staff that we lean on. It is not a legalistic practice that we feel forced into. Like last week, the kids had been sick. We took a break. We said, we're not doing Sabbath tonight. We're all tired. It's just too much, which we did Sabbath, but I mean, all the other things that go with it. (laughs) Yeah. And, um, that, that has been transformative for our family. They just Mm -hmm. know what to do and they look forward to it. And they love it. And I think as adults, they'll probably end up doing it with their kids. And that's amazing. Mm. Um, So that's been the best gift. Yeah. Some of those, those family culture things that, that you can hold on to as a child Mm -hmm. and then look, you know, it's important as a child. And then you look back as an adult and I'm sure your kids are going to go to college and they're going to talk about these, you know, traditions that they had as a family and other kids are going to go, man, I wish I had that. Yeah. You know, and and we take it. Yeah. And we take it, you know, for granted as a child, but we don't realize the joy or the, you know, for me, family dinners were something that we did almost every night. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't have the TV on. We did it around the table. 
Uh, Mm -hmm. Not everyone was always there, especially once we got older because people had games and practices and, uh, you know, but we would have dinner and we would sit there. And so, Mm -hmm. um, and I know that that was important for me and my brothers. And so I I love this idea of having this at least once one meal. You know, the rest of yes. the week, maybe it's a little off, you know, the helter right. skelter, whatever happens. But this one meal, we're here as a family and taking the distractions out. Um, yep. You know, I, I love that idea. And it sounds like maybe it's like a family thing to get rid of or get ready for. It's not like it is. You're doing all the work. So you're sitting down stressed out while everybody's coming to the table. You know, I mean, sometimes that happens. but <laughs> <laughs> I don't I mean, want to make it look like it's always oh hunky dory. Like we definitely have our moments, but yeah. it is all about rhythms. We all know that with anything. Yeah. Um, yeah you're more absolutely. likely to go to church. Your family's more likely to go to church if you actually go to church every week. <laughs> Do you, can you uh, list, um, before we get to our final question, first of all, can you list a couple books or resources where that have helped you as you've kind of set Sabbath into your family? Yeah. Um, Dr. Matthew Sleeth wrote 24 six. Okay. Uh, that's a great read. Um, Adam Mabry, the art of rest, uh, also a great read and just resource for getting going. And then uh, I mentioned sacred rest earlier mm-hmm. by Dr. Sandra Dalton. That one, uh, I feel like every Christian should read just to figure out how do I even rest? Yeah. Um, and then lastly, probably, um, the ruthless elimination of hurry by John Mark Comer. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, that's a newer one. I mean, that was like last year that that came out. It is. And he Mm -hmm. has um, a whole series on Sabbath. That's really helpful on practicing the way.com. If you go there and just put in practicing or put in Sabbath, you'll find it. Awesome. Uh, how can we find you online and, and your podcast? Uh, if we're, if you know, we want to go check out that episode with your husband. Yeah. So it's grace enough podcast.com. You can just go there and type in, you know, basically Sabbath and everything I've said about Sabbath will pop up. Mm. And then I do hang out on Instagram, like we mentioned earlier, the most, Mm. and that's grace enough podcast underscore Amber. Awesome. Well, we have one question we ask at the end of all of our episodes, and that's uh, that none of us are meant to live this life alone. Uh, So who is it that has helped you along in your journey? Oh, my goodness. I feel like that I could mention a million people, but um, names come up like Johnny Burke and Francis Cooley and people when I was, you know, younger. But then like we talked about earlier, young women willing to lead a Bible study, even though they didn't know everything. Mm. Um, but as an adult, I became really good friends with our teaching leader at BSF, Allison McCoy, Mm. and she started mentoring me. She was about seven years ahead of me with parenting and all the things. Okay. And I mean, she just, she's been one of God's greatest gifts to me. And then Mm. my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law loves the Lord she's real. She's honest. She's deep. And, uh, she'll let me ask some really hard questions. So (laughs) those are a few hard (laughs) questions about your husband. Like, tell me how she'll do that too, but no about (laughs) faith about faith. (laughs) Oh gosh. Well, that's great. Well, Amber, I can't thank you enough for kind of demystifying maybe some of the things of what it looks like to apply Sabbath, you know, here in America and in a a family with kids and work and so many things going on in life. It can be hard to just be like, is that even possible in America? You can do it. Yes. Thank you for letting us feel like you can do this. You really can. You can. We can. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here with us today. Thanks so much, Courtney.